Hey, well, thanks for joining us. And uh, we're just gonna continue the conversation. It's not a one-off conversation, but it's a, a continuance. And uh, so this is, a, I guess, to, to frame it, we're really talking about social justice in the, in the context of um, where we find ourselves in this, in this time of history, which is a, a, a moment where just maybe, just maybe, there is uh, when we're gonna really look at what, uh, what history has brought us to where we are now and maybe history will look back on this season of, of life for a lot of people, or maybe this time in history, where the whole issue of, of racism that has uh, been so much a part of so many people's, our history, when it comes to living here in the UK, anyone that lives here, it's, it's all a part of our history, the whole history of racism, and just maybe, just maybe we, as I said, we'll not just look back on history and realise how we got to where we are, but in the future, they'll look back and they'll say, hey, this was a, this was a generation, this was a time where it was, uh, it was done away with. We can uh, only pursue something with, uh, I believe, with, uh, with good intent and let's really believe it together. Um, and obviously talking to, to believers, our context is, and, uh, and let's uh, really believe that this is part of our, our p- part of our sense of, Purpose, yeah. sense of mission, and and what we're what we're about. So, I'm uh, tonight. As I said, we're gonna. It's a it's a conversation. It's a continuing conversation. It's not a conversation that you just have move on. Um, and so I got Mr. Watson. Hello, sir. Daniel. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and Hank. So Greasy. once again, mate. What? <laughs> I, I must be most respectful of uh, of you. So, so once again, give me who you are, what you do. Not who you. I know who you are, but just for the sake of the conversation. Yeah. So, I am a detective inspector in the Metropolitan Police, and I work in the Modern Slavery and Child Exploitation Unit. And I'm a senior detective in that unit. So I manage. Um, approximately 20, 25 people, um, police officers, police staff, making various decisions about modern slavery and child exploitation cases. Wow. Wow. That's a... That's pretty big. <laughs> that's a, you play it down, but it's, that's a pretty big role, senior role there. I remember my, my dad, he was a police officer as well. So you're a detective inspector. Yeah. So he was a, a DCI. I don't know what that stands for, but it, it sounds good. <laughs> Detective Chief Inspector, so that's, that's one rank above me. Okay, okay, yeah. I remember when he passed out in 1980, like, well, within those years, I can't remember exactly what year, but I remember when I was a kid looking at his photo, yeah. and uh, I know it was one of the proudest days of his life, right? But looking at his photo, he was the only black guy who passed out then. You call it passing out? It's passing yeah, out. yeah, yeah. So to explain passing out, it's a, it's a military term. At the end of your... Um, training, there is a parade, the passing out parade, where you are basically congratulated for completing the training and you're officially then um, inducted into policing. So they do it in the military, they do it in the police. So that's what that so was. So it's a pretty proud day. Yeah, 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 definitely. So, so you're, a, you're a police officer. I am. Um, and so, you know, in a time, time like this, where everything, it's pretty, it's pretty big now, and, and you know I've been to many of the protests myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, there's yeah. lots of chants, I guess, that go on. Yeah, yeah. For, yeah. for you, as a, a black man, and not just a black man, but a police officer, yeah. the tension's pretty, pretty real right now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and this is what I kind of spoke about when we last spoke, just that tension of, you know, Black Lives Matter is something I, I believe in, um, and the, spe- the specificity of it, referring specifically to the relationship between black people and police, and black people in the state. And that's something that I recognise, there's mass disproportionality everywhere. Um, and I recognise that as a police officer. So believing in that concept and that cause, but then seeing that 
there is conflict with the state, the state that I'm serving, and the idea that my job is to man well, not maintain law and order alone, but to keep everyone safe. And to see my colleagues being injured and um, being assaulted and actually people reveling in that um, and some, some people being seriously injured is very difficult or has been very difficult. And so it's been a bit of an emotional roller coaster, um, and I find myself talking about it a lot, uh, having been interviewed a number of times and speaking to colleagues and, you know, within the police, there's a lot of conversation around this, so... Um, so, so what sort yeah. of conversation, when you say conversation around in the, in the, with the police, because I can, only, I can only try to understand the tension that, that you just said. You just said, well, the, here's the tension, but the amount of depth of emotional tension mm. yeah. in... Um, in it mm -hmm. is uh, would ha would be obviously very very high. So when yeah. you say talk to colleagues, what what what, ty what type of things are the other things that they the tension for them even? Mm. Yeah. So I guess it's this sense of and it depends who you speak to, but overwhelmingly I've seen a sense of sorrow, and I've said this. <laughs> Repeatedly, a sense of sorrow that things are not as they thought they were and that potentially the police have perpetuated this inequality where, you know, many people, I join the police because I believe it's a noble profession. It's all about helping people. Um, and many people have the same impression and to think that actually we haven't been helping people. We've actually been harming people. Um, and so there's a reflection, there's something that, that people have said to me, and that is when the police arrive, they are in fear of their lives. And actually, I remember as a custody sergeant, there was one occasion, so just to give the context, the custody sergeant is the person who's in charge of custody. So when you're arrested, you're brought into the police station, you're brought into custody. The custody sergeant, is responsible for the welfare of everyone there. When an officer arrests someone, they must present that person to the custody sergeant and justify why they have made that arrest. The custody sergeant then decides whether detention is necessary at the police station. So I was undertaking this role. So when you walk into custody, you can see that the custody sergeant is in charge. So that already was a dynamic and a black man was arrested. He was brought into custody and he was immediately surprised when he saw that I, as a black man, was the custody sergeant. Um, but where it became really um, impactive to me is that I decided that that individual needed to be searched more thoroughly. So I instructed those officers to take him to a police cell to search him. At which point this guy became absolutely terrified and he said if you take me to a cell you're going to kill me that was his honestly held belief mm, he wow. honestly believed <clears throat> that if police officers took him to a cell they'll kill him so so you as a as a policeman because i'm trying to picture this in my head you as a policeman how does that make you feel as like as a as a black man and as a policeman that the profession that you chose people and people that look like you look like me don't feel safe yeah, it's upsetting, to put it simply. It's upsetting because that... Yeah, it's just a difficult, difficult thing to comprehend. And, and so many people that I've interacted with have responded, thank goodness, you know, thank goodness the police have arrived. But then it's that... that there was an incident, and this is in America, but this kind of illustrates just how distressing it is so um, it was a welfare check, so a neighbour hadn't seen their neighbour or hadn't seen a lady who lived in the house um, for a while. This was in Fort Worth, Dallas, Texas. Called the police to say, I haven't seen my neighbour. Police attended. The officer, for some reason, didn't knock on the door, 
but kind of went around the house. And you see this in the body cam footage. He then saw the, the lady in the, in the front room and shot her dead in her, in her, in her house. Oh. Yeah. And so it's like, you know, you were called to check if this person was OK and you've ended up shooting them dead. And the neighbour that called the police says, I wish I'd never called the police. And that's something I'm going to have to take with me to my grave, that I called the police and as a result, my neighbour is dead. And so when, when I hear that as someone who is, has dedicated my life to helping people mm. and the very institution, the very organisation that is meant to help people is perpetrating that kind of violence, that's just... I don't really have words for it, to yeah. be honest. I want to, I want to ask, I'll give you this scenario. So today I, w I, was, um, I went to the hub with another member of staff who's, who's black as well. And the hub is our like workspace. Yeah. And um, I, I put my fob on the door, opened it up, but then the alarm started going off and I didn't know there was alarms. <laughs> I was like, oh no, I don't know the alarm. Yeah. So it started going off. I called someone up, put the code in. And then by that time they told me, well, you're probably going to expect a, a visit from the police because they're going to check that the, yeah. the building's okay. So immediately I'm into panic mode or get my stuff in order so when they come, I can prove that I'm all good. So I, <laughs> I got a picture of myself up from the, the Hillsong website. Seriously? Yeah, <laughs> from the Hillsong website. So, OK, I work for, for Hillsong. Da, 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 all this different stuff. And that was, that was straight away in my head to prove my innocence. Yeah. Not to, you get what I'm saying? Yeah. So as, um, as, a, as a policeman, you know what I mean? How can we, how do we change that in people's mindsets? that the police are there to help um, and not to, to make you feel guilty, first of all. Yeah. And I suppose it goes further than just feeling guilty, as in actually feeling fearful that yeah. you'll be subject to, to injustice. How do we solve that? That's a massive question. Um, and for me, it's, it's a systemic issue. It is the view of black people within society um, and it is changing the narrative around black people in general, particularly black men. Um, there are narratives around black men being predisposed to criminality. Um, so for me, it's changing those narratives. How do we change those narratives? If I'm honest, I'm not entirely sure, but um, I hope that I can perhaps be an example of, mm. you know, someone who is is fighting what is essentially a stereotype. Um, but then it's really difficult because I, there's part of me that says, why should I have to fight that stereotype? Like, why does that stereotype exist? Mm. Um, and the thing for me is it's not just in the police. So the police is the, is the visible re representation of the state. And what the police does is absolutely obvious, but this kind of inequality exists across the system. Yeah. So for me, it's not just about focusing on the police, but the whole system. Uh, how do we do that? I, I don't have an answer for you, yeah. if I'm honest. I don't have an answer for you. Not that I can think of in the moment. You're true there, because it's one of those things where you go, you throw the, the stone at the frontline people, the people that you see, yeah. and maybe not the systems behind But it. even when you... Because you, you touched on two things. So there's the, the system that represents something, and then there's a stereotype. And it's... There's, a, there's an element where it's like, OK, so we've got a deconstruct a stereotype and, and at the same time d does the system just deconstruct itself because the stereotype change uh, changes mm. or is there's a there's a two-way there's a you know because when we're talking about systemic we're not talking about well it's just a here is a series of um of events mm. or um even you know institutional things there might be, you can say, well, there's institutional racism in something. But the systemic, from what I understand, is we're talking about it is everywhere. And so, therefore, everything, 
everything works to reinforce, to propagate, to create this stereotype that, um, that what he just said, here he is, <laughs> it's his office, right? His own office. So there's, no, it's his, if we talk, he's talking about the hub, it's his office, there's yeah. two senior people in that office. Yeah. Um, Robbie's got his staff, yeah. Dan's got his staff, so it's his office, it's not even, and he's trying to, uh, I need to prove that this is my office because I'm a black guy. Yeah. Um, just the fact that he feels like that and just the fact that that's probably the reality just speaks volumes to the reality the, of, of, uh, of th this, this whole thing and how real it is. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, because if, you know, I don't know who, who he is with, but um, I promise you if he was with probably Robbie, he probably wouldn't have said anything because he wouldn't have need to say anything, because Robbie would not have been, Robbie wouldn't have to prove himself mm. that it was his office that he was going into mm. because it doesn't fill the stereotype. Mm. So it's like this. Yeah. Yeah, and you know what, it gets, it gets into the mindset. So I realized that I had internalized this narrative about me as a black man and that I had to adjust myself in certain spaces so that I was non-threatening. So in your case, yeah. you are anticipating what the police response will be and you don't want to be under suspicion. Mm -hmm. So you're doing, you're going to ridiculous lengths to prove your legitimacy in having access to that building. Um, and it's because of this narrative around black men are predisposed to criminality. So I realised I had internalised this when I went on holiday with a group of people um, from church, most of them were from church, and one of the places we went to was Montenegro, which is in the Balkans, next to Croatia and Serbia. Um, and me and another guy, Sam, who's black, we went into a shop, a supermarket, went to buy some stuff, was at the cashier, cashier didn't speak English, and then suddenly the cashier calls over the security guard. So me and Sam are like, like, we're in trouble. Like, the security guard is coming. The security guard comes, arrives, full of smiles, and starts speaking English. So the only reason that the cashier had called the security guard is because he speaks English. But because we have internalised... So yeah, yeah, yeah. We, our, our bias was... Yeah. The only reason a security guard is being called is we're because back. we're under suspicion. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, and then, you know, on, again on that holiday, I was just walking along and I think I was playing Pokemon Go. I really got into it. <laughs> <laughs> so I was playing Pokemon Go and um, there was this arch um, and there was a bit of a shadow of this arch and I was just chilling there and I was standing there and then suddenly I was like, this looks suspicious. Like, I need to, I need to make myself not look suspicious. Mm. Like, how can I be standing in an arch? Like, and then I was like, hang on a minute. Can I not just exist yeah. in this space? I'm literally just leaning here so that I can play Pokemon Go. And what, well, I guess what I'm saying is there's this constant, you feel this constant need to regulate your behavior in spaces so that, you know, people do not feel threatened or that you're, you're not looking suspicious. So, so, if, so as a policeman, right, so you're, I don't know, you, you, do you find yourself in a place where you're trying to, um, do you react to the, the stereotype of you're a black policeman and this is, this is what they're like, this is, is there a stereotype where you feel like I'm constantly feel like I'm adjusting myself? I'm talking about now you're arresting someone. Okay. Or or your um, your there's this there's this stereotype that you find yourself constantly coming up against. Yeah. So um, the stereotype, the obvious one, is that as a black police officer, you're a sellout. A what? A sellout. Yeah. Um, or you're a traitor or 
So what, one of the terms that someone used to me was, you're serving your white masters. Um, there was another person who was referring to Kin Kunta Kente. She was like, you've forgotten your, um, you've forgotten your heritage mm. because you're arresting a black person. Um, and the thing for me was, I was determined to just be fair, to be even-handed, because that was my understanding of what the role of, of yeah. an officer was. To be fair, to be even-handed, and you know, not treat people um, unfairly, perpetuate injustice. But then I do recognise that within the police, there are, there are, or there have been some biases in the training. So the bias that I think of is, and I've said this repeatedly, uh, the reasonable person test. So we um, use the term reasonable a lot in the law, and that is um, the test that we're given of what is reasonable is what would the average person think. And the average person that we're told to imagine is the man on the Clapham omnibus. And man on the what? The man on the Clapham omnibus. So if you Google, if you Google the term the man on the Clapham omnibus, yeah. you'll, you'll basically find all this legal um, okay. explanation. Yeah. So an omnibus, um, as it's referred to in this phrase, is an old form of transportation which is horse-drawn and is basically a horse-drawn bus. The idea was the average person is this man who's sitting on the Clapham omnibus and he's from a particular background. But the issue there is, in that reasonable person test, the reasonable person is a man and he's going to be a white man with right. a particular background. Yep. So as a police officer, I have been taught to think of the imaginary or hypothetical opinion of this imaginary of person, person. Yeah. and that informs what I decide is reasonable. So I, it's only... F so do you find yourself, right? Serious question now. Yeah. So do you find yourself, so he's a lot younger than I am, so he could, he, he probably fits into the category easier. I'm older, well, maybe these days, what's age matter when it comes to being a criminal, right? So, um, so you've got, you're arresting me, you're arresting him. Um, do you find yourself hey, I've got to actually, now I've got these multiple filters that I have to actually respond to based on what I think his perception is of me or what, so if I'm you, your perception of me. Now, you're two different people, but I can't just go, I'm going to arrest you because you need to be arrested and I'm going to arrest you because you need to be arrested. I have to behave completely different because I know he sees me this way, you see me this way. Do, do you have to manage that? Yeah, out? so that's a good question. If I'm honest, I try to not let that affect my decision making because for me... But is, is the pressure there though? I think there is pressure, certainly. And in those situations mm. from, from what I've described, that individual or that individual's family or that individual's friends might push back on me as a black police officer in the ways that I've described, to say, this action that you're taking is unjust. But then the law requires that I am able to justify why I've taken that action. Yeah. So that's the best I can do in that situation. Um, for me, it's a case of saying, what are the facts of the case? Has that reasonable person test been established? Now, um, now I've begun deconstructing that reasonable person test, I start now thinking about other people mm. and what would they think? What, what would Dan think if I took this action? Would he think it's reasonable? So thinking about what different people might think is helpful. Mm. Um, well, I, I remember even, but yeah. I don't know if we can talk about this, we can, when um, one of the young, young guys got arrested, yeah. falsely arrested. Yeah. And, um, I was like, I was incensed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like incensed. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, well, someone needs to get down there, send yeah, yeah, yeah. the lawyers, all of that. Yeah. And then some of the other guys were like, ah, this, this, this is sort of, this is a path of the journey. This is, 
This is how it plays out. We're almost as if to say, we are, we're used to this. Yeah. And um, we're trying to work out whether we stop because there's a siren just gone off or we don't. It's Millwall. Yeah, it's Millwall. What's that? It's uh, Millwall. Okay, well, that's all right. So anyway, so we're in a warehouse in Millwall. So yeah. <laughs> anyway, the conversation is real and happening now. You lead it over the road. <laughs> but, but, I, but I think <laughs> that... Um, I think that... It was one of those things that where it struck me was this almost like, well, we're just w welcome to how it plays out for us. Mm. And yeah, I, as, so... a, as a, you know, I'm sitting there going, so I'm, you know, I'm a white guy and it's my son that's been falsely arrested. Like I am, I'm sort of, I'm swinging off the chandeliers. Yeah, yeah, when, yeah. yeah. So when, the the, when this guy gets arrested yeah. and the, the response was, well, you know, it'll, it'll play out and it's this and it's because of this and it's because of that. I'm thinking, that's wrong. That's like, but that's, that's the tension that is a very real tension that people live under. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a tension for you as a, as a police officer, if you were an arresting officer and all of that, that yeah, you're, so now, you're now playing out while I'm being... I have to be suspicious of him, but I don't know about him or... And they're yeah. very real... Ten are, they, they're, are these real tensions? That's what I'm trying to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the issue, the, the incident that you're referring to, um, and we have to... Yeah. So the incident you're referring to, unfortunately for that individual, they were literally in the wrong place at the wrong time. And what I mean by that is it is the... It is the bigger factors of living in an area where there is a lot of crime and there is a disproportionality with the crime being perpetrated by individuals. So there are a disproportionate amount of young black men involved in criminality. That is a fact. Why that is, we can unpack. Well, um, and that individual, unfortunately, is a young black man. And there was a crime that took place in proximity to where he was and those police officers basically had connected him to that crime. And no, I get where... that, but what the, point I'm the point I was trying to make is, is yeah, I get that, and I, I get the fact that, okay, it's disproportionate, young men um, involved in crime, and, and they, you know, I guess, do I fully understand? No. But have I determined over the years to try and understand why is it disproportionate and yes. what can we do about it yeah, yeah, yeah. and all that. Absolutely. So I don't need convincing on any of that yeah, yeah, yeah. and I don't need convincing on why it's disproportionate, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I still come down and go, it's just wrong. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. it doesn't matter whether it's disproportionate. The fact that so quickly we're going to treat this kid like he's, he's a suspect and we're pretty sure he's guilty. I'm, yeah, yeah, I don't know so where that's, that's, that's going to so play. That's, 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 that's the system, the deep rooted that's stuff. The de that's, yeah, that's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's unpacking, so. it's, it's, it's this type of thing. So I guess the question I would say to you, right? So you're in it, yeah. right? You're, you're in it, this is your daily life yeah. and all of that. And we, you go, well, why is the, the crime rate disproportionate? You ask all of those, those questions and it does come down to it comes down to the fact that we we live in a in a society where racism is a reality. Yeah. It's it's something that is it is generational. It's it's shaped the world we live in and the product or the end result of that oppressive thing manifests itself in this type of thing. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, absolutely. Whether whether we whether we want to admit it or we don't want to admit it, it's reality. Yeah. Right? Um but so you, so you're you know, you do what you do, and I guess what, what you do is you, you do with the, the pretty bad end of human behaviour, mm. right? But just as a as a, a general policeman and all of that, for for you, if you go, well, okay, how do we make this? How do we make this better? Give your give your give your wish list almost. What's your what would your wish list be to? How do we how do we actually make that? How do we change this? How do we make it? 
Do you understand what I'm trying to say? I totally do, and I suppose it's difficult to think of how to fix it and just being honest because, um, you know, is it that we need more black police officers? Um, I'm not sure because there are police, police uh, services in America or police forces that are more representative than the Met Police and they still have issues. So is that the answer? I don't know. Um, changing the law, I mean, that's, that's difficult because, because the whole system is the issue. Can we convince lawmakers to make different laws? Um, it's just really issue. It's just really yeah. difficult. I just don't, I just, I honestly, like, I honestly don't know. But it's, because, to, you know, look, looking, listening and looking and, and all of that, we're, we're talking about, we have to actually engage in, this is, this is a, a re, if you use the term restructuring, reordering, reframing of actually the construct of society. Yeah. yeah. Where, because you just, you just can't change the police force and it's gonna f fix, fix, it's not gonna fix racism. No. You just can't, you just can't say, it, it's this holistic approach mm. to, um, to what's going on, that's. Yeah, 100%, and I think, I, usually I think the education system needs to change because I feel like, you know, you've got all these adults that have been taught stuff or been conditioned in a certain way because the education system has actually failed us. Because mm. more people will know, you know, in terms of history, what we get taught, you get taught about the Victorians, the Tudors, but nothing about Windrush, nothing about slavery, nothing mm. about that sign of stuff. So it doesn't exist. Um, you know, the truth behind the world was. It doesn't exist. And so we get painted this different picture. Yeah. And we've been conditioned that way. So by, even by the time you're an adult, it's really hard to, to change. So I think it's education system and heart one of the things that I wanted to ask you or pick up on is I, just a little while back you said, you know, when, when black people see you as a police officer or whatever it is, you're a sellout. Yeah. Um, and that, that pressure there to, you're a, you're a black man, you're a police officer. Right. How, do you, how do you deal with that pressure? Because in actual fact, you want to try and change the system. You yeah. want to better the system. You want to help it for everybody. Yeah. But people don't see you like that, so you've actually become dehumanised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get what I'm saying? So black people won't see you as a black man, they'll see you as a police officer. And maybe within the police force, they'll see you as a black police officer. Yeah. So how do you... That's... Yeah, good question. Um, so I guess over time, just resolving my purpose and understanding that I've been put here for a reason, uh, and that reason transcends the opinions of other people. So where someone says those things, I know that I am doing the best that I can and it's the mere fact that I exist um, is helping black people, but also making moral decisions, making the right decisions. And so, yeah, there has been occasions where there's, there's one specific incident where it was a stop and search encounter and I, I did a stop and search on a guy and he was like, your parents are ashamed of you. And <laughs> I, I, I mean, I could just kind of laugh to myself because I was like, you don't know my parents because they're not ashamed of me. Um, but what, what happened to me in that moment is that I sort of resolved in myself, well, and I was asking the question, hypothetically, in my own mind, what, is, what are you doing for black people? So you're pointing the finger at me and saying that I am not helping black people, but what are you doing? And then I resolved in myself that actually a lot of the people that are criticising me, as it was at the time, I couldn't see what they were doing for black people in general, but I could see that my presence in the police and trying to do the right thing and trying to influence what was happening 
was doing a great deal. And now I sit in this position where I'm a detective inspector and I'm in charge of various protocols, procedures, I'm in charge of other people, you know, I'm doing further study and becoming an expert in criminal exploitation of young people and I'm being asked all of these questions in this moment now, so not in this interview, but, you yeah. know, in this period of time, my voice is a voice that's being heard. So when I reflect on it, it's the fact that God has put me here that I recognise I've been put here for a reason. In that moment, yes. it was, what are you doing for black people? Now I don't ask that question because I'm like, God has put me here for the benefit of everyone. Yeah. And I can see that now. So it can be painful, but it, it's not such a, a big thing to me because what's bigger is my understanding of my position yeah. in God's plan. And what I'd also say is that, and there's this, this one incident has stuck with me. Um, it happened, it happened about 10 years ago, or maybe 11 years ago, not far from here, so maybe, an, maybe a, about a mile away from, from here, um, where a young black guy was shot, stabbed and run over. And I've spoken about this before. Um, so he, he was, it, it was a case of mistaken identity. And there was a gang feud going on in Deptford he was, he, it was a case of mistaken identity. There was an argument over a bike. This individual was on the bike and basically some, some other guys in a car ran him over or knocked him off the bike. Then they stabbed him, tried to kill him and then shot him with a shotgun. So it's pretty horrific. And then I remember police being called um, and I was the first person, the first police officer to arrive to this young person. And there was a paramedic who was already working to try and save his life. So I started trying to help this guy. Um, and in that moment, I thought, what is the difference between me and you? Like, I might be two years older than you, or three years older than you, and you're lying on the floor, dying, bleeding yeah. out, and I'm not. What is the difference between us? Mm. And so it re invigorated my desire to understand why young black men are so disproportionately affected by crime. And that has driven me through my career to understand why and how do we fix this and how do we resolve yeah. this. Um, and this is something that, you know, I, I, I was passionate about before I joined the police, but I still don't have an answer. I still don't know as in, I still don't have a physical answer, as in a physical thing that we can do. I know that Jesus is the answer, mm. but I don't want to say that as a glib comment um, because we know that Jesus is the answer, but people still die. So what is it that we need to do with that to change the narrative, to change the stories that are happening? Yeah. Well, you know, and that's where, you know, we're from, you know, some... It all depends who writes things like what I'm about to say. <laughs> it depends whether people believe it or not. Um, but, you know, some authors would say, some people would say, whoever they, they are, that our identity is, is the who we, who we are, how we identify with ourselves and what we shape our perspective of ourselves. all of that is, um, is a product of circumstance. Mm. And so... The, the challenge is, is, is the circumstance that people are born into, the world that no one, no one chooses what world they're born into, you're born, just born into it. Um, but that circumstance that you're born into determines so much about the path of your life because it determines so much about how you see yourself how you see yourself determines the path you're going to, you end up walking in and how you react to life, how you respond to life, all of that. So it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's really, as, as the conversation continues well, if we're about all of this, what we're talking about, it, it's really about what has to happen so that the circumstance yeah. is no longer the same. It's, it's, Absolutely, it's yeah. Getting to the, it's getting to the why. 
why is that person like that? And once mm. you get that understanding, then you can start hitting the root. But once you, once you start dealing with behaviours, you just, it never really works. In this whole time, even listening to you speak and weeks before this, I'm getting an understanding, and even like empathy, compassion for my dad. Like, you know, my dad passed away a few years back, but, um, and many, many people may know, might not know that my up upbringing was pretty rough. But like I said at the beginning, 19, 1980s, he, he passed out as a police officer, the only black man in that photo. And his only dream was to be high up in the police force. That's all he wanted to do. And hearing you talk about, I guess, the pressures, the dehumanization, all of that stuff, I've got an understanding now what he was going through and how he was trying to make it in the police force, mm. but dealing with all the racial stuff then in the 1980s, 1990s. And so then he would come home and take that pressure out on family. And so not saying what he did was, was right or excusing it, but I'm learning to understand it. But you're, you're a product of that circumstance. Yeah. But he's a product of his circumstance. Mm. And it, it, and it's like, so if you start with him, the pressure he's under, why? Why is the pressure there? Yeah. It's, it's, it, and so it's, you know, and that's why I think at, what, the more and more I'm, as we get into this conversation, is it's, it's not either or, it's everything. Mm. It's not just looking at this from one angle. It's looking at it from every angle and it's at addressing it at every angle all at once. Yeah. That's yeah. that. You can't just, well, let's, what are we going to do about youth, youth crime? What are we going to do about young black men who get involved in crime? That'll solve the whole problem. It's not. There's, no, absolutely there's not. such no. a broad, it's, yeah. it's within the structure of society and it's about how do we, it's about addressing it on, on every mm -hmm. possible level and somehow getting everybody to say, you know, we're all gonna put a hand up and say, Con, how do I play my part and uh, in addressing mm. this that is the, um, that is the, the issue. Um, you know, I'm, you know, gotta be careful what I say, how I feel about things. But um, I sort of sit there and I, I think, you know, we can sit there and we can say, well, you know, young black men are disproportionately involved in criminality and and then there's this reason and there's that reason. But why don't we just take a really big step back and go, I thought we were a modern, civilised, sophisticated society. Uh, leaders in the world as a nation. All the, all the, all the grandeur terms yeah. that we speak about. Why are we not working out how come this still exists? Yeah. And just go... And, Come on, this is, this is, this is time to, to really look at everything and say, well, where's it wrong? Why is it wrong? What needs to be done to, uh, to put it right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I that, guess is that too high-minded? No, no, no. <laughs> I guess, I guess, if if I was honest, I have come to the position, and and I kind of struggled through this over the last two or three years, the more that I learned about my country, the more I realised that, that these things that I have been told about my country are not true. And that itself, you know, has been difficult. And I think that's where my greatest tension has been. Um, so we've talked about me being a police officer and the, the potential tension that there may exist there. And I appreciate that for many looking at me that they would perceive that tension to be hard to manage. Uh, but the truth for me is that I, I exist here. It, it is a reality for me. And I grew up managing uh, and navigating predominantly white spaces. Um, so I became very comfortable early on on how I need to behave because I went to a school where predominantly there were white people but I grew up in a church that was predominantly black so and we, we refer to it as code switching so where um, a black person or an Asian person or someone who's a minority will behave one way in one space and behave another way in another space so I learned that from an early age so going into the police wasn't 
that difficult for me, not as difficult as some others might find it. But the, the issue that I've had recently, and for me, George, George Floyd's death and the incidents that preceded that and the rise in sentiment, I haven't, I haven't been as surprised at all that this has happened. And it's funny because someone said that I predicted it, not to say that I'm some sort of oracle, but I just saw what happened in America and I was like, it's only a matter of time before the sentiment rises in the UK. And that's because I had come to the realisation that there is a perception in the United Kingdom that we are forward thinking, that we're fair. And actually, when you look at the stats, it's not true. And that is the lived experience of people. Mm. So me as a police officer, my lived experience has not been one of experiencing what a lot of people describe as police brutality. So I say I'm not necessarily the person to ask about that, particularly now as a DI, when in those interactions, I'm going to have power because I have a good understanding of the law. Uh, you know, it would be unfortunate for a police officer if they did stop and search me and they didn't give the right grounds. It would be unfortunate for them, yeah. let's be honest. Yeah. Yeah. It would be very unfortunate for them. So I, I have no fear in that, in that interaction, but the majority of black people do have that fear because yeah. they don't possess the same power. So I guess what I'm saying is that when I, when I reflect on myself and where I sit now and my feelings and the tension, the tension is where do I belong in this country? Where do I belong in the United Kingdom? Am I welcome here? Um, and depending on which day, sometimes I'm like, yeah, this is, you know, yep. Britain. And other days I'm like, hmm, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. So interesting, man. What's that? This is so interesting. Even when you said, you know, the bit on power. Mm. You know what I mean? I think that's, that's racism at its essence. It's who holds the power? If I hold the power, then I can oppress you. I can make you feel like that. And it goes, okay, how are we actually going to change this across the, the nation? It's about the people in power looking at themselves and what they hold and what they represent and going, we've got to do this in a just way, fairness. Well, it's, it's, it takes, it's, 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 it's an all-round effect. Mm. So it's, it's a, a total buy-in at every level. Like, I, you know, whether this is the right conversation or even the right thing to bring up, but, like, I'm still fascinated with the statue that got pulled down mm. in Bristol. Now, you're a policeman, so we won't worry about the legalities of whether it was legal, illegal, right, wrong, all of that. But what I'm fascinated is, how come we didn't just stop and go, the dude's a slave trader. Why have we got a slave trader, a statue to a slave trader up in one of the major cities of, of the country? How come we didn't just go, now that's weird. Yeah. That's, well, that's weird on every level that you'd have a statue of someone that was a slave trader. Oh, but he, he started an orphanage. Yeah, whatever, on the profits from slavery. It's like a statue to yeah. commemorate him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're upset that it got pulled down. Now, whatever the legalities of it not being there and all that, I don't care. But the fact that we haven't been able to go, the dude was a slave trader. But then I think that's, that therein is, is part of the issue because it depends who you talk to. So, yeah, it seems obvious, perhaps to the three of us sitting here, that having a statue to someone who's a slave trader is a bad thing. Um, but not everyone is in that position. And so it can be hard to try and have a conversation. Hmm. Oh yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah, it can be hard to try and have a conversation with someone who says, um, no, we should, we should keep that statue there. And uh, there was a democratic process around that statue and the, the decision was made to keep it in place. There's another statue. Uh, I'm not sure if it's still there. Cecil Rhodes, um, who had lots of uh, dealings, shall we say, 
in southern Africa, Rhodesia, which then became um, Zimbabwe, uh, I believe. I'm, I hope I've got that right. But the point is that there was a de democratic process, there was a, a campaign to remove that statue yeah, but some the, years ago, but, but it's and, in and it failed. But, but the, what I'm trying to say is, it, I, do, I sit it there and I go, all right, so, okay, whatever, I'm a white guy and I'm an Aussie, so I lose out on every particular angle we could think of, and I'm old. But um, the concept that you could go, is a statue to a slave trader. Well, that's a part of our history. We shouldn't pull down our history. Yeah, well, I've been to some pretty bad places in the world where really bad things have happened. And the history is remembered, but it's not remembered in a statue to commemorate them. I've been to the killing fields in Cambodia and it's there to commemorate, not celebrate, mm. the, the atrocity mm. of that whole regime and those people that died. You don't go there to go, well, there's a statue of Pol Pot. Isn't he just awesome? Mm. He's a part of our history. No, yeah, he's a part of our history that we want everyone to remember and it was abhorrent. Yeah. yeah. But then so I think... If, we, if we're going to remember our history, we need let's to re remember our history of, for what it is. Yeah, exactly. I agree, And yeah. not celebrate... And that's the education system. That's the education. And I think there's been a selective... Or oh, I know there's been a selective... Um, process with how that history is reported and I think that's personally I think that's part of the issue that we need to have an honest appraisal of our history as Great Britain and that and I believe that's starting to happen yeah. where we're starting to bring out some of these things but you know even our own government has has taken actions and it's it's challenging you know as someone who generally respects the government to say actually there's an action that has been taken in the past that is clearly immoral for me, to me. Yeah. So my expectation is then, okay, I, will you leaders in power recognise that this immoral action has been taken and will you address it? And there's two specific things that I'm thinking of. There's the payment of um, compensation to slave trade, yeah. to slave owners, yeah. which was only paid off five years ago. Uh, and there is the um, covert destruction of records as part of Operation Legacy between the 1950s and 1970s. And that was in relation to British colonial records. Now, what that means for me as a police officer, an agent of the state, where my core belief originally is that the state is just, and now I'm confronted with evidence that the state is unjust, so I am looking quite intently to see how these things are dealt with now. Um, and I have an expectation, and, and my expectation is, as a British citizen, I expect you to deal with this. Yeah. And so there's, 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 there's so many levels mm. and so many um, complexities on so many, so many levels that are so, much, so complex and all of that. But I think, you know, just sort of, coming to a, drawing to an end. Mm, mm, mm. This, uh, you know, th I think as we just keep moving forward and, you know, I'm really speaking about to us as a church mm -hmm. and all of that. And, you know, we're talking to you as a church member. We're not, and, um, and the fact that the, the continuance of the conversation that is about understanding and seeing things and maybe being big enough to to um, see things from a different perspective, a perspective that isn't, isn't the same as um, perhaps I had before and where people start, start to actually take that position because it's amazing how you, how you begin to see it. The more you see, the more you see. Yeah. And the, the more you see, the more you realise it, it's everywhere, but because it's everywhere and you're seeing it more of it, there is more you can actually do about it too. So it's not like, I, I don't sort of look at it and as, as this all continues, as go, well, this is just, it's impossible, blah, blah, blah. It's not. It just takes a, a wholesale endeavour to say, it's time that we saw things differently, yeah. which will just impact the knock-on effect because if all of this is a product of circumstance, 
will start beginning to change what the circumstances. Absolutely. And what contributes to what the circumstances. Yeah, absolutely. And within time, um, God willing, and that, no, that don't, I don't like saying that, I don't know why I said God willing, God's intent uh, in time that, um, that we can, uh, can see something different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Stay committed to it, Hank. You're awesome. Yeah. You're awesome. You're still, you're still hanky hank to me. <laughs> <laughs> the to problem be, is we all get rapper, older together. Huh? Just putting that into context, you used to be a rapper. I did, yeah, yeah, some time ago. <laughs> uh, and I did a lot of that. Um, and I enjoyed it, but time has moved on. Times have moved on. <laughs> oh, fantastic. All right, well, um, you're doing an awesome job, as I said. Thank you. Stick with it and um, keep, you know, born for such a time as this, Hank. Amen to that. God's going to give you strength and all of that. And, um, and we're with you. Yeah. Um, we're with you. And, mm. Um, mm. Mm. And, and, and I'll say that I feel that. I absolutely feel that. And that's been the really good thing for me to be overwhelmed by the amount of support. And I've said it, I've said it to you before, the reason I've been in Hillsong for the time that I have, what I described, some of those tensions, coming into church, hope in the gospel, that is what has energized me. And then people coming around me, speaking positively to me, encouraging me, you know, I haven't just popped up out of nowhere. Yeah. Um, there is a legacy of people that have supported me and church has played a massive part in that. So, thank you, thank you, thank you, church. <laughs> and I think, you know, because we're talking about church, you know, we can all, we can all play our part. Mm. And, um, you know, don't, don't get exasperated, don't, don't give up in frustration or anything like that. But if we just all... Um, just all find the part we can play mm. and play our part. We don't have to be, we can't solve everything by ourselves, but together we can solve a lot of things. Mm -hmm. and, um, Absolutely. So we just commit to playing our part. And, um, and I think that the challenge, you know, um, you know, because there's all d differing circumstances that people find themselves under. And uh, I think, you know, there's so something about when people are oppressed, and you know, oppression's, oppression is a is there's so many different contexts to it. Mm. But the, one of the things that gets taken away when people are oppressed is their ability to speak up for themselves. Mm. And uh, because it that oppression just suppresses, and it just needs needs people to speak up on other people's behalf. And and I think sometimes for a lot of people they don't know what to do. But there's one thing they can do is speak up on behalf of. Yeah. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to know everything, but you, I think we can all recognize once we see it, understand it, hear people's stories, understand that that person's been oppressed, whatever the, this is a broader context than just when we're talking about, we're talking the context of, of race, but there's so many aspects that our, our place should be is to speak up on behalf of those who are oppressed. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Defend the, defend the position that someone's in as opposed to be suspect of their position. And yeah. There's lots we could say on it, but we can all play our part. That's the, that's the point I'm trying to, Absolutely. Trying to make. Well, man. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, then. Thank you, sir. Thanks you, Daniel. Thank you, sir and sir. Great conversation.